Welcome one and all to the newest episode of my RPG podcast. Today's episode we talk about uh, RPGs outside of Dungeons and Dragons with my friend Dan Wallace. But before we get to that, I posed a question out there on the Twitter. The Twitter is at classy underscore Don, that's D-O-N. I asked uh, what everyone's favorite non-D&D RPG was, and I got quite a lot of responses actually. So I'm just going to go through some of these to kind of uh, give shout outs to everyone who did reply to my uh, post. So uh, one we got a couple of times uh, was the Legend of the Five Rings our, uh, RPG, which uh, Jens as well as some other people said. Uh, there's also uh, Persona 4. Let's play and roll, uh, says Persona 4. While this was uh, kind of tabletop centric, technically Persona is an RPG and it sure as heck counts. So yeah, Persona is obviously very cool. We had Elias Thompson and Alex Rosenberg mention that um, Realms of the Wild, which is also part of the Open Legend RPG system out there. Open Legend, I've actually mentioned before on this podcast, is really, really good. So lots of uh, kudos to those people, and that is an awesome show. If you guys have an opportunity, watch the Realms of the Wild Zelda RPG on the uh, Zelda Universe Twitch channel. Ben the Bear. Ben Bear Smith, our friend, says SLA Industries, WHFRP, I have no idea what that stands for, and Dark Heresy, as well as Call of Cthulhu. Those are great ones. We've got uh, my good friend JP Rakath uh, says Rollmaster. Apparently he played the early edition from the 80s, and it was his main RPG for over a decade. And he still has all the books. Uh, you'll actually see he sent a pic of that when he replied to my comments. Uh, now we've got a... Uh, Winter Sandal is, is, is the name. The handle is Roland Von Schlag, and he says uh, Space Punks, which is a, a game about being a punk as fuck, which he thinks is the greatest role-playing mechanic. And I've never heard of Space Punks, but now I definitely want to check that out. Uh, we also have uh, Shadowrun up there. Tilly, Wooden, Tilly Woden says uh, Shadowrun, as well as Eclipse Phase. Uh, we've got Vampire, there we go. I was waiting for somebody to mention Vampire. So we have Vampire Dark Ages. We have uh, Wraith the Oblivion, which is another White Wolf game, uh, apparently according to the Ban Monk. That's Jason, the Ban Monk, uh, who also shouts out Rollmaster and Legend of the Five Rings. Um, oh, ooh, here's one. Uh, Better Legends, the handle is at Sam Amelli. Says everyone is John. Everyone is John. Uh, I actually seen that played on Twitch uh, before, and it's a really interesting RP RPG where you're all playing this character with multiple personality disorders, and you kind of interject uh, to kind of uh, take over the scene uh, as it's kind of, kind of a one-on-one -on -one RPG where you, the players are interjecting to take control of John and things like that. Um, yeah, I had a bunch of fantastic. Uh, suggestions and requests and i was really really surprised at how much uh different rpg systems that were out there um on this podcast we discuss a whole bunch of them and if there's any that are mentioned by dan i actually have links to information and ways to buy them in the podbean page that's my rpg podcast.podbean.com just look in the details underneath this episode and you'll have a whole bunch of links without further ado let's get into the episode Welcome one and all to another episode of my RPG podcast. Today's guest is Dan Wallace. Dan, will you please introduce yourself? Well, hello, I'm Dan Wallace, um, at Evil Dan Wallace on Twitter, if you want to follow me there. Shameless plug. Um, yeah. I love shameless to... plugs. I love shameless plugs, Dan. That's kind of a point of the whole thing, huh? <laughs> Ultimately, yes. But, um, Dan, we're going to kick into our topic of the world outside of D&D &D in just one second. But I wanted to get a little bit of a primer on who you are exactly. What's your history with RPGs? When did this all start? I don't remember exactly what year it was, but it has been at least 20 years ago that uh, 
friends of mine were playing this stupid game um, that apparently had a lot of rules and no uh, meeples, even though the, team, uh, the term meeple was not really invented back there, I think. And um, yeah, it sounded really dumb. So <laughs> at some point I wanted to join them and they let me. And that's how I started playing uh, Das Schwarze Auge, as we say in German, or uh, The Dark Eye, as it became known uh, in the English-speaking world. Um, yeah, and I've been playing ever since. And when I play, say I've been playing ever since, I mean that I have had pretty much a weekly group for over 20 years. So it's not the thing where you play in your teenage years and then you get out of college or something and stop playing for a few years and then pick it up again and tell everybody, oh, we're playing for over 20 years. No, I've been playing for over 20 consecutive years. And that makes me better than all of you. No, no, absolutely not. I, I, in, in better words than that, I was going to say that's an amazing accomplishment that I think very few people can ever kind of tote that the continuous play is, is such a hard thing, especially nowadays with everybody being so uh, busy with their schedules and whatnot and moving. And the fact that you can have an established group for such a long time is an amazing thing. So you, I think you said it was Dark Eye was the first one, but what were some of the ones you started with? Just some names out there for anybody who's listening. So it was Dark Eye at first, and then I didn't even know there were any other role-playing games out there. And um, I can imagine that there are a few people out there. Wait, there are other role-playing games then blank and blank is usually D&D &D, I think in the English-speaking world especially North America and um, then somebody told me about Shadowrun and so I joined the Shadowrun group met one of my best friends who I'm gonna see tonight by the way so uh, some of the people that I've started playing with are still around and I still play with a, with a bunch of them um, yeah, so I started with Shadowrun, and then we, I think the next one was uh, Vampire the Masquerade and the whole um, World of Darkness settings. Then somebody brought up Cyberpunk, and I ran into a bunch of people who played GURPS, and yeah, I don't remember where it went from there, but I've been playing a whole lot of different systems. And kind of, you mentioned it earlier, you know, in, in the German pronunciation, so we know you're obviously a German speaker, but based in Europe, was there uh, as big of a D&D &D kind of surge in the early uh, to late 60s and 70s as it was in America, or was there a completely kind of different sort of tabletop role-playing game surge at the time? As far as I know, it, I'm not an expert on the history there. Um, there was no parallel to um, to D and D in the 60s and 70s in Europe. Um, I think it started in the early 80s with um, D and D kind of washing over to Europe, and um, yeah, then independent systems uh, or other systems uh, inspired by D and D. Um, beginning to to emerge and i do know that the dark eye is pretty popular it's most definitely or was back then definitely the most uh, prevalent system or the most common system in in germany and i think it also was one of the uh, most uh, popular systems in france and well okay um england wales uh, ireland and scotland were probably D, &D country <laughs> back then because they didn't have to, have to translate anything. But I think the idea was when you have to translate the rule books, because not that many people spoke English well enough to, to read a rule book, a RPG rule book, nonetheless, um, back then. If you have to translate the rule book, the thought of, of kind of changing it in the process or maybe just write a completely new thing in your um, language, that, that might be a a thought that that is not too far out there and you know one of the great things about this kind of perspective here we can talk about now about you know being european and being different is from the american standpoint when rpgs kind of blew up here especially you know kind of uh championed by D, &D there was a common misconception that this was either very childish and or satanic 
as a, there was a kind of uh, a, a, a stigma against it in the media. Was there something similar in Germany? Because from the conversations I've had with you and I personally, it seems like Germans are far more open to tabletop board gaming. They've been on this for quite a long time. Yeah, the, most of listeners and you have probably heard the term German style board game. Um, there's even a, um, a Cards Against Humanity card, uh, a German style board game where you inv- invade Poland. <laughs> <laughs> and um, actually, the the German board game craze is actually linked to the First World War because there was a ripoff of I think it was Ludo um, uh, or Sorry that kind of game where, where you pretty much roll and move your meeple and kick others out when you land on them. And the German soldiers in First World War uh, hospitals played that a lot because when you were hurt back in those days, you had nothing to do. No Netflix back then. And um, yeah, and they all brought the game and this gaming spirit home and bought games for, for their families. And that's how, at least from, from what I know, the, the German board game craze started. And uh, yeah, then came along Mr. Schmidt. Uh, he founded Schmidt Spiele, and that's the company who made the first board games back then, and also the first company that brought out the Dark Eye. And you mentioned it before, so let's go a little bit in deeper. What is Dark Eye about? What type of RPG is it? Oh, it's pretty much the common um, fantasy RPG. There's a continent that's called uh, Aventurian, Aventuria. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Bear with me here. And you've got pretty much the fantasy races that all the fantasy games have, like elves and uh, dwarves. Um, gnomes were not that popular. There were a gnome kind of, of, of race there, but um, yeah, and uh, different human... Um, uh, different human variants, like a Viking type uh, variant, and different regions, and all of that. And you had your magic users in different varieties. And yeah, um, it came with a whole world, um, pretty detailed, which is one of the things that did drive a lot of people away from it because the 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 it's not true. But the common stereotype is in the Dark Eye world, the you have something written about every every house and every fence and every every forest what and whatnot and yeah um uses d20s um but you roll exactly the other way around so you have to roll under your um under your uh skill and or your uh, your stats and so uh, the the don't fuck me gill 20 um can i say the f word <laughs> Okay, great. Um, the the, the uh, t- uh, twenty um, or the one is exactly vice versa. So in in um, the dark eye, one is actually really great, and uh, the twenty is actually really bad. And in D and D, it's vice versa, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and for anybody wondering wondering about that reference, just uh, look up "Don't Fuck Me, Gil" G I L on the internet, and that's really a, a, a mutual friend of ours, Gil Ramirez, is quite a, a RPG D&D celebrity. Uh, you'll find out why when you look it up, but he's commonly associated with the critical uh, failures, rolling ones. But um, and I'm so, holding a bottle opener, hand forged by him in my hand right now. That's fantastic. Yeah, and he also makes uh, a great dice, and as well as other um, metal metallurgy because uh, he's a blacksmith himself so uh, you can go support him and all his stuff just look up Gil Ramirez but we that a tangent when aside, he wasn't famous we knew him when he wasn't famous yes we knew him when he was just Gil Ramirez not uh, internet famous Gil Ramirez but um so going back into Dark Eye I, I wanted to ask you so it seems like there's the traditional kind of toking-esque fantasy tropes that were pulled the same from D&D and Dark Eye as well was the, aside from you mentioned it's still a D20 system but the numbers are inverted meaning ones are better than 20s was there any other uh, kind of big, distinct things that made it different, or was it just kind of a German translation fantasy RPG generally? The system was completely different in, in many ways. It kept a few of the core principles. You had your um, your basic um, attributes, skills, uh, attributes and skills. Um, so you had your basic stats and then uh, the skills on top of that. You had hit points, you had um, uh, astral points, they were called, and um, they're just pretty much your magic points work, pretty much exactly as uh, hit points work. 
uh, you lose them when you cast a spell and you regain them when you rest. And uh, yeah, a bunch of spells, and that's pretty much it. Your character class gave you or gives you, they're still, I think they had version 5 now too. And uh, yeah, I think they have taken pretty hard dive because nobody really liked version 5 and part of the uh, team actually left the game and started a new one called Splittermond, um, another German name for a German game. Um, Splinter Moon is, I think, the really cool sounding name in, in English, actually. Okay, um, sorry. Um, so it's pretty much the same mechanic. And back in the first version of the Dark Eye, they actually um, had the whole you kill this creature and get that many experience points for it system um, that many don't like in D&D. And yeah, it was pretty similar. Did some things better, did some things worse, but basically the same thing. So if you can pull from your memory back to that first game or those first games you played in Dark Eye, do you remember what you played and uh, what the gaming was like? How much of it was RP? How much of it was you know loot and kill? Do you remember any of that? Oh yeah, I remember well. Uh, my character, I forgot his name, was a mercenary, um, so a fighter type character. Um, not as good as the dedicated uh, warrior character, but a uh, um, little broader variety of skills and uh, yeah, little little broader variety of, of weapon skills. Um, and uh, yeah, the others were on a rather high level already. So I um, stayed with my friend Jörn uh, overnight and we played mostly computer games and I started making this character like here's the books and this is how it basically goes and started and then i had to had to actually um level my character up without ever having playing the game played the game and the way the first edition at least worked was there was this big list of uh, skills on the second um, uh, page of the character sheet and um yeah you could raise pretty much everything and um, if you wanted to but that's not how you make a character you raise your skills that you are actually going to use and then forget about the rest if you want to make a somewhat efficient character at least and I thought oh this is interesting let's put some points in this and oh that's interesting too let's put some points in that and I ended up with a mess of numbers and um, really inefficient stupid character that hadn't even leveled the most core skills uh, to where I could level them. And yeah, it was, it was pretty much a clusterfuck. Um, yeah, and the first gaming sessions were fascinating. I actually had, never having played a minute of RPG in my life, I had expected um, more of the, of the let's get to the point um, type of game, like, maybe not hack and slay but I, I thought we pretty much had a mission like in a computer game where you maybe get a little introduction story and then it's go time and you solve the problem and I came into a gaming session where they had left off uh, at a point where they were pretty much going shopping <laughs> and so they were like hanging out at the tavern and uh, talking crap to each other in play and then looking for for weapons on the market talking to merchants and then a, a hint of plot came along and um yeah they they started to follow it for a bit but then dropped it because there was something up else uh, that was interesting and yeah i was i was i i didn't know what to do like at all <laughs> So it's funny you mentioned kind of coming in and having uh, being surprised at the difference between how you play computer games. Uh, I'm assuming computer RPGs and things like that is the, uh, the thing as I've run into that a couple of times. I'm always constantly trying to get people into uh, more RPGs. So when I suggest to them like how it should play, I always ask them as a point of reference if they've ever played like a video game RPG, you know, PC RPG. And uh, when they do, I, I am extra conscious. Of when I when I maybe give them a first session or a first taste to see how railroad how they sometimes tend to railroad themselves or think like okay well it has to be beat to beat to beat point to point to point find the thing kill the thing get the reward um, it's really interesting to kind of give them that well technically you can try anything you don't have to just follow along or you don't have to be in a scenario where there's a clear objective or directive you can kind of just explore the world and I think that's kind of fun that you had the same experience. 
Yeah, and, and that is very much the way I like to run my games. I do play more a fair bit, but I mostly run games by now because I have the same amount of fun when I'm running games than from when I'm when I'm actually playing, which is what I, for my year not not normal. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I don't mind running games, so I mostly do that. Um, but um, that's how I try to run my games, and that's how I try to, to play. Um, I often call up, I'm, I'm kind of infamous for <laughs> calling my game masters in between sessions and be like, I've got this idea, and I think my character would like to do this the next time we play. And some game masters are great with that, and they're like, that's a brilliant idea, thanks for giving me a heads up, just do what you want. I'm prepared. I will. I will roll with it. And some game masters are like, no, I was actually planning something else. And uh, those are the game masters that I don't really get along with, and where I usually drop out of the groups because, yeah, if if you don't let me do what I want um, for no other reason than you thought you want us to, or you think you want us to do something else, and yeah, no, we are we are not going to work together as an RPG couple. <laughs> yeah, the, the the thing I always say is it's the dungeon master or the game master's job to service the players, not themselves. Um, take that in whatever innuendo way you want to as well. Uh, so <laughs> we so I so actually yeah, actually see that a little bit different if we just give me this one minute tangent. You have uh, uh, all the time in the world. Go for it. Okay, great. Because I would actually say nowadays I see myself as a player at the table that just has a different role to fulfill. Think of it as, um, in an, I mean, RPGs are still, um, and pen and paper RPGs in fact, are still just games in, in big quotation marks here. And uh, so there are rules. This is not Vietnam after all. And um, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm, a participant in the game the rules are just different for me and that's the same in, in so many games nowadays where where you have uh, different rules for different players and somebody plays another role in on the same in the same table but there are still rules that apply to them and there are still uh, ways in that they participate in the game even though they are different than from the others so me as a game master i'm just another player on the table and i'm not there to serve anybody that's not an idea i'm opposed to but i'm there to have fun too so um yeah it should work for everybody involved yeah totally and you know i i enjoy helping my players have a good time i don't obviously give them everything they want because i think part of uh, of, uh, a good moment is the difficulty or the strife or the challenge you had to uh, overcome to then get to said moment. But, um, you know, it, my, my whole thing's always been like when you mentioned e- calling or emailing your dungeon master and being like, I have this idea. It's to always come from the angle of like, even if the idea maybe uh, doesn't work or I don't like it, is to come from the idea of like, maybe if or yeah, but what if we like trying to work, work with it? Because ultimately these people want to have a good time and they're taking their time out of their day and their schedule to come to your table or if you're online to, you know, sign on and be present and dedicate that time. So I, I would hope that they get something out of it because I'm always getting something out of it because when they're having a good time, you know, my, my favorite moments are probably the least ingenuous moments. Like it's not like a clever character or a big boss battle or amazing setup. It probably comes down to the fact of like just an event happening between the players, which I then, you know, was probably breaking a rule or maybe was super ridiculous and when it happened, but I kind of let it slide and it turns into this amazing moment. We're all cracking up and laughing. And I'm like, that's why I do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had this brilliant moment lately where I, um, um, well, not too long ago, where I um, <clears throat> called the Dungeon Master or the game. I'm not saying Dungeon Master, come on. The game I've, got you. <laughs> I've got you, I've got you. For scheduling reasons, actually, because we, we just forgot to, to talk about the next time we wanted to play. And it's that kind of game where we always say after the session, where, okay, who has time next, whatever day, and then, yeah. Okay, so I called him, and he was like, yeah, we, we talked about that, and Helene was, dude, you seemed really frustrated today. Was it, like, too much? And I was like, I was totally frustrated, but that's not because of you. That was my character. I mean, can you imagine if we fuck this up, and if we fuck this up in this other way, and this other way, and this other way? That would kill me. I mean, my character. And, and not, like, like, physically but that would be like the worst thing ever and and yeah and that was today was really stressful but 
that's great. That's good. That's, it's like you know, I'm I'm not always here to have fun. I'm here to to feel something. Yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tangent too much here because I do want to hit some other RPGs out there. So opposite spectrum. We've talked about your uh, Tolkien inspired fantasy. So let's talk about Shadowrun. What's Shadowrun about? Yeah, um, Shadowrun is pretty much a really nice um, uh, intermediate step for me um, because Shadowrun is pretty much um, what if in a near future, dark future world, think William Gibson, Neuromancer, think um, Blade Runner, think that kind of universe. Um, if um, suddenly due to a surge in the magic level in this world, um, uh, all the Tolkien races came back like orcs and uh, elves and uh, gnomes and uh, dwarves and all of that. And also magic came back and dragons and everything you know from your uh, classic fantasy setting. And uh, add in some cyber technology, which, well, years ago you had to explain it. Today pretty much everybody knows, but I will give a little pointer here. It's um, stuff you implant into your body or connect to your, your nervous system and... Um, yeah, that makes you better, enhances you, augments you in, in some way or in the other. And um, yeah, um, plus a world uh, run by um, gigantic uh, Megacon uh, companies that uh, have pretty much more power than, than um, nation states. What a great um, fantasy you're talking about. Wouldn't it be funny to live in that world? Yeah, it's actually not, but uh, fear not, because they are the Shadow Runners, da, 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 which <laughs> is pretty much what you play. And uh, yeah, they are, I'm very sorry for the loud mouth noise I just made. Sorry. That's fine. No, we, we, we love all points of the of uh, nerdy and funny. But yeah, so Shadowrun being kind of this um, newer, uh, futuristic um sort of fantasy take um is is one of the biggest i think uh common tropes the same way i don't know if it's the same in germany but in america like typically when you think about tropes you think of the cybernetic future hacker type thing especially in the late 80s early 90s there was that was all over the place thanks to also like stuff like the matrix and stuff coming out creating this kind of tech tech punk type thing going on so you, you when would you when did you start playing Shadowrun if you don't mind saying Oh, um, I must have been like 15, 16. Um, so I do remember that I have been playing Shadowrun for a few years when the first Matrix Matrix movie, movie came out. You can imagine how I how I looked back then. Like, <laughs> I can imagine I black trench coats and sunglasses. Yes, yes I, I knew it. Black leather trench coat and <laughs> all the all the things. Um, so yeah. I, even in Germany, I wasn't allowed to drink beer when I started playing Shadowrun. <laughs> so, just systems wise, uh, Sh Shadowrun function the same as most systems. Are we talking D twenty, D sixes? What what sort of things are going on there? Shadowrun back then was uh, two point zero one D, which was the German translation of the Shadowrun two point oh. Um, it had some different rules, some some minor changes, uh, and then the. I actually think, well, I started with version 2, then I uh, had one group which was who was still playing version 1, and then we all switched over to version 3 some years later. Um, uh, back then, it was, uh, well, it's still the 6s. Um, you had your, um, your, your core attributes and um, or your core stats and then skills again. And you rolled the D6s against a, a target number, and the number of uh, successes you had um, gave you how, how good your roll was. So target number usually was 4 back then. It's now 5 because they are in version... I played some version 4, but I haven't played version 5 at all, so I don't know. They changed a bunch of things there. Um, but back then, it was uh, target number was usually 4, could be higher, um, if you roll a six, it explodes, so you roll it again, and the number, so a six and a five uh, with the same die would be an 11. And, yeah, um, the more um, of your dice hit the target number, the more damage you do, the better your spell, the better your uh, intimidation attempt, whatever. Yeah, and do you have any kind of fond memories from those days, any characters or moments? Oh, 
tons of it. So the best thing that we got running here in a small town, rural, no, not rural, but small town Germany, was that we actually, there's this runner scene. So shadow runners are people who get hired usually by cons or people who who want something to um, they want something done. So it's this whole idea of, I don't know if you've seen the movie Ronin, where this, uh, or a little bit like Heat, but the group gets hired. Um, so you've got this group of experts, hackers, grifters, uh, thieves. Oh yeah, I'm talking leverage now. <laughs> and uh, the, the team gets hired by either somebody in a Megacon or uh, whoever uh, to do something very specific. Uh, easiest thing uh, to think of is murder somebody or steal something. Um, but they, uh, it gets complicated really fast because if you want to get it, uh, or want, if you wanted to get more complicated as Game Master, then you can. It's like, do this, but don't do this and don't touch that. And yeah. Yeah, so um, that's what you do. And there's this runner scene usually in, in a city um, that this recruitment pool, this shadow runner recruitment pool that um, um, yeah, you can talk, usually contact through some um, some some people uh, who for some reason usually run bars. <laughs> and um, yeah, we, we got something like that going here in town. So I could actually call on a Saturday back then, back in the days, I could actually call like three people and I knew that they had like two or three characters. And then if they had time, we would just meet somewhere um, at, at the, at one of the usual places and then we would pretty much decide it's like yeah okay the the johnson it, all um, um people who have jobs for you in, in shadowrun are called johnsons because they don't want to give away their name so they always call johnson um if you're in germany they're actually called schmidt <laughs> okay fair enough i guess the idea is the common generic name right yes exactly um and yeah so um when we had exactly that. So you would just as a game master say, okay, it's uh, something that has to do with breaking and entering and we would need a hacker and some, some other character. And then one guy would be like, yeah, I really feel like playing my hacker character so-and-so today. And the other one is like, no, no, I just want to be some street muscle today. So I'm going to play that character. And then there would actually, the, the team would form on the table before you actually start the game. That's um, actually really fantastic. It's kind of a, like a almost real world like bulletin board i need x y z and you guys show up with their characters and you figure out the dynamic yeah. right there the best thing ever was um when somebody wasn't there and we needed something from the, one of their characters we could actually call them and be like yeah i would really like my character so and so would really like to talk to your character so and so for five minutes and so people would actually kind of uh, <laughs> telephone Joker, dial in to to give some information or offer some skill or whatnot um, on the on the game table. And that was fantastic. I have no idea how we managed to pull that off, but we did. I'm super envious. That's a, and that's also something you can only kind of get away with in a more modern or futuristic setting. I, I do want a quick tangent here. I know a lot of people were a big fan of uh, this, or uh, and other people were not. There was a Netflix show recently, Bright, about kind of modern day, a little bit, like not the super hacky angle, but very much the modern day magic meets uh, our sensibilities uh, called Bright on Netflix. Did you, did you have a chance to see it? Did you have any thoughts about it? I have it on my list. I have not seen it yet. I have heard so many different things about it, and people are going on it from so many different angles. I'm very looking very much forward to it. Also, Altered Carbon, also on Netflix, sounds like right down my my alley of of Shadowrun and and with the latest Blade Runner movie that rekindled my love for Blade Runner. That was already burning pretty hot still, but. <laughs> So you, you mentioned uh, also a, a name there I, I don't know enough people know about. You said when you're mentioning your RPGs, GURPS. Now let's, let's explain first, what the hell does GURPS mean? Yeah, GURPS stands for Generic Universal Role-Playing System. Um, it's by Steve Jackson Games, who, well, Steve Jackson invented GURPS and he also invented, um, um, what's it called, the card game, come on. Munchkin. Um, Munchkin, yes, of course. Um, GURPS is a universal generic system, so it doesn't come with a word attached, as we talked about the Dark Eye and we talked about um, Shadowrun, which have which are kind of tailored for this one world. 
you don't need rules for cybernetics in the dark eye because it doesn't have any so you don't have any rules for that GURPS pretty much has rules for everything um, they don't always work brilliant and the system has a bunch of problems I actually have a, a picture of me talking with my hands to Steve Jackson who looks like really annoyed and I told him that I wanted to take the picture because I told everybody that I would tell him everything that's wrong with GURPS <laughs> He just said, oh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, so GURPS, not perfect, but it's pretty good. So you can run most settings from very low-tech level Bronze Age games to high-tech. It has GURPS. Uh, GURPS has rules for magic. It has, GURPS, uh, it has rules for hacking. It has rules for um, oh, yeah, whatever. Um, car combat or vehicle combat. Uh, yeah. As I said, they're not all brilliant, and the system definitely has its flaws, but if you are like the very creative type uh, who likes to make games up on the spot, GURPS is for you. Just try it. You will love it. Yeah, and I remember you actually telling me before about your issues with GURPS, maybe when we were talking to Jens one time, and we came up with a hypothesis of our own superior European role-playing system, SERPs. Uh, so <laughs> I, I don't have the trademark on that quite yet, but uh, I think if you just write down your thoughts there, I might I, I might get that trademark eventually, and the next thing you know, we'll be surpassing Steve Jackson. <laughs> well, um, GURPS is not selling that well, from what I hear. Um, there is no new edition planned, but uh, the nice thing about GURPS is you've got uh, the two, uh, two core robots for GURPS 4, and um, then there are... I have no idea how many, probably hundreds at least uh, of um, GURPS 4, but also GURPS 3 and earlier um, rule books for, or not really rule books, but they are um, supplementary books for different settings. Um, and they are really good. They are like brilliant re brilliantly researched and um, yeah, they are, they are really, really good on, on world building on different kinds of topics like horror or like steampunk and whatnot so if you ever want to gift a role-playing gamer or anything and you don't know what then just ask them for their favorite genre and get the gurps books because it will have it will be usually pretty rules light and have lots of backgrounds in it and yeah you can you can even read those and enjoy those and, and use those in your games when you're not playing gurps you know, and you mentioned the rules light thing is one of the topics I kind of wanted to have. As we're talking now about more and more different RPG systems, we're finding that the core principle remains the same. It's just a method to role play with a system attached to it to kind of determine the rules of the universe and things like that. But how much of the RPG you think should be a game, should be the challenge, should be the mechanics here? Because there's this kind of tendency, uh, I'm going to play devil's advocate for now for a little bit because I love to do that, is there's a tendency uh, nowadays, or, or maybe I just think nowadays, to kind of uh, let the rule of cool win and, and, and kind of let your players kind of do as they wish, you know, bending rules uh, to kind of let them have their moments. But how much uh, stock should be in the system and should playing the game itself, the actual mechanic of the game, be a big po uh, component of... Uh, running any RPG. Okay. Um, <laughs> little disclaimer up front. I have opinions on that and uh, plural opinions. Um, the thing is, what I think is completely irrelevant uh, if we are not playing together uh, because you do you. I don't care how you play. Um, just, just find out whatever works for you. My opinion on the whole topic is, um, as I quoted uh, um, um, from the Big Lebowski movie earlier, this is not Vietnam. We've got rules. And um, I, depending on the game I'm playing, I stick to the rules. And I don't, I mean, if they don't make sense because there's something in there that, and yeah, you, it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't, the physics just don't work out to what the rules state, or you, you, do suspect that there's a glitch in there come on go ahead and, and change that um, but um, the rules in role playing games are like the rules in real life and by rules I mean um, rules of society but also uh, laws of nature 
Um, and if I want a character, uh, if, if I let a character walk out of the window onto thin air without any reason, then yeah, what's, what's the point? Um, I do tend to stick to the rules as much as I can, especially in genres where other people think that's not so important. Um, and I think rules are important. It's also important that the rules work for you. Um, and your game and your players and all of that. And I think I lost my train of thought a little bit here, but it's, it's um, fine. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of vamp from here as well. So the the kind of I guess the argument, um, I, I, on, you know, devil's advocate uh, once again for a lot of people is uh, you, this is still ultimately a game. If we were just playing to uh, allow each other to do whatever, then we're not really playing a role playing game. We're just kind of doing. Storytelling. We're just doing community storytelling or just community theater, you know, improv theater, pretty much. So yeah, the which, fact is, which is so the thing is, if you want to play improv theater, that's great. I love improv theater, and uh, hi to aforementioned Jens here. Um, but that's not playing a role playing game. So if you want to play without any rules um, and just do uh, collaborative storytelling, and the just again in in big quotes here, quotation marks here. Um, uh, then, then you do you. That's great. But the thing about rolling dice and and having to stick to rules is that it gives you a frame and it gives you gives you limitations. And from what I believe, also outside of um, of role playing games, um, it's it's really great to bring out creativity. Creativity stems not from limit uh, lessness, <laughs> but it actually stems from limits. Because if you find find limits and if you find um, uh, problems you run into, then you have a chance to to really bring out your creativity by solving those problems and and um, working with them. So if your character can't die um, because well they just can't, it's not not in the book. Then um, yeah, it takes a lot of of, of tension out of the game and uh, it makes it less fun, at least for me. Yeah, and you know, there's a I think an interesting uh, aspect in some games of that, like uh, incorporating that sort of like hey uh, debate between the GM and DM about like, well, I want to try this. Well, the rules don't allow you to do this, so can I get away with this and can I get with that? I think that's part of also the fun of playing an RPG is you have this broad idea where you're like, I want to do something really, really cool. Well, what in my arsenal, what in my character, what in my equipment can I use to facilitate that? And what in the scenario can I get from the DM or GM that will allow that to happen? That kind of is, I think, also part of the mechanic of the RPG. It's not just, oh, cool things happen because I will them to happen. It's, I am in the scenario, I recognize the potential for something cool to happen, I try it, I either succeed or I fail, but either way it's fun for the attempt. And most of the great uh, I did this in a game story do not stem from I wrote so great, but I wrote so bad. Yeah, totally agreed. And this actually brings me up to something I was reminded of another system, uh, since we're talking about various systems that people uh, should check out. I've not played the system yet, but there is a system called Outbreak Undead. It's a kind of a survival RPG uh, made by, I know, at least one of the people who made it is Ivan Van Norman. I think he had a par partner, so I forget his partner's name. Sorry about that. But the idea of this system is similar to, you know, you have to roll up to a certain score when you're creating your character. And, you know, deviations of, I think, five is how bad or how good the thing happens. But during the actual game, there's a mechanic in which then you can kind of argue to your uh, uh, DM or GM to be like, hey, because of this thing with my character's backstory or because of this personality trait of my character, can I have my, my score rating increased? And he'll tell you, okay, you can roll this to try to increase it and by uh, by that means you can kind of build your character as the game goes on. And I think that's interesting that pretty much fourth wall breaking conversation that you have in the moment. Like, oh, well, the zombie is going to bite you. And then you go, well, DM, hey, I know my score here says 14. Uh, I think you roll on 2d10, so you roll on a 100 scale. I, I think my score here says 14, but I, I, you know, I did martial arts when I was a kid. I did, you know, taekwondo and karate all through youth. I think I should have some sort of abilities to retain that. And he goes, fine, roll 2d6 and add that to your score, right? So something something like that, I think, is an interesting way to 
combine more of that um, back and forth conversation, kind of del deliberating with your DM and GM while also still making it a game. Yeah, totally. And I love mechanics that um, I do not have, and actually have to do with your character, but with the uh, with the storytelling aspect. Um, there used to be the Forge forums. I'm not sure if they are still around. I've got yeah. Um, they did a lot of role playing theory. The the big model came from that corner of the internet, and uh, yeah, it's on Wikipedia. You can look it up. It's really interesting, and fascinating. If you want to nerd out about one of the nerd hobbies ever get into role playing theory and uh, one of the mechanics that came from that um, direction too was this um, like the simplest way simplest way to introduce this element into your game is to say one of uh, each character or each player has a token like a special die or whatnot and you can hand this over to the gm to kind of get to root level access to gm level access to the game for like this one moment so I can actually say, well, here's my special die, and I'm actually not over there where you drew me on the map. For some reason, I'm suddenly over there at the Doomsday Machine switch, and uh, I can flick the switch now and start the Doomsday Machine. And um, that gives a whole new dynamic to the game, because you, you add another element with a rule and, and all the limitations that that has, because maybe you could actually use that one moment of GM power later much better um, but it gives another another element in there also um, uh, Edge of the Empire was the first one of the new Star Wars games I don't know what the system is called actually um, they've got a mechanic where you roll one die that uh, tells you how good things go for you in general so my, maybe you pick the lock but right the moment when you uh, have not really put your lock picks away and it, the, right in the moment where you have where you can't really argue your way out of that a bunch of stormtroopers walked around the corner because you wrote your check well but you wrote this one die bad or the other way around the doors actually open or whatnot and introducing these um, rules for storytelling of hints for for storytelling into role-playing games is something that i find really interesting so Dan, you know, you mentioned a little bit earlier that you, that you like kind of being by the rules and things like that. Would you say you're generally someone who likes there to be more mechanics or more systems for how to run a game than kind of one of these open-ended RPGs like Open Legend or stuff like that where there's just general stats and you figure it out from there? That really depends on the type of game. Um, if I play a technical game, as I would call it, like Cyberpunk or Shadowrun, I want there to be shopping, and I want there to be 25 different options f f to choose for which I put to my gun or toothbrush. And uh, I, I want that. And I want there to be a really detailed combat system where every little put I, thing I put on my toothbrush earlier gives me an advantage or disadvantage in the game that I can actually measure and where I can actually point to. When I'm just have a lazy Sunday afternoon, I do like to play play games like uh, I think it's pronounced Jesus because it's Latin from laughter, which is pretty much uh, you choose your you make your character by choosing a few cliches and then you attach dice to these cliches and then well if you are a Viking you can with your Viking cliche you can. Uh, steer boats and 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 uh, hurt people and with your poet cliche you can um you can uh maybe sing a song or talk really impressive if you have to and the, yeah you you can figure out from there and i like both those types of games it really depends on um in what kind of mood i am who i'm playing with and, and all of that so the clear i don't know <laughs> yeah no problem i mean you've got so many RPGs out there, you know, the whole point of today's uh, episode was to kind of uh, kind of t tell people that, you know, D&D &D and on, on this podcast right now, I featured almost extensively D&D &D stuff, but there's so many RPGs out there and so many options that could fit your mood, light or dark, serious or comical and whatever you like. Um, to, going back to the thing you said at the very top of this um, podcast, and I really want to bring up one more time is... Being able to maintain a, a running group for 20 years, probably, I'm assuming, through multiple systems as well, right? Yeah, multiple systems, and um, it, it was not one group. I usually had, like, two, and then one dropped out, and I 
kept playing with the other and but yeah i do still play with the same guys pretty much and they are guys for some reason dang it yeah we wish that you know i'm, I'm really happy that i i have a, a, a sunday game which at, at one time was dominated by like three women one man and at another time it's like three and two but it's always been more girls than men and uh i've had you know multiple females in my other games as well and i'm so happy when that happens and i think it's great that more women are into rpgs but yeah you know i, I kind of wish that uh i i'd gotten into this sooner because i also think like if i'd gotten into this sooner i think i would have gotten way more better social skills because i found out through rpgs very quickly that like you know, talking to people isn't like I don't have to be such an introvert and stay in my corner and play my musics and listen to you know my my step my stuff, uh, and I think that also would have helped me with talking to females as well because uh, this I'm going to pick on myself here for a moment. Females are just people; they like things the same way you like things. So if you ask them like, "Hey, you want to play an RPG?" Don't think, "Oh, she's a girl; she won't." Like, she probably will. Yeah, totally. But it turns out people are usually people. <laughs> That's the takeaway. Females. This is the takeaway from the podcast, everyone. People are usually people. Sometimes they're, they're gnomes and dwarves, but those are people too. But yeah, so for, um, for for going that long, for sustaining that long, that must be fantastic. I mean, what's your game? Just, just from my own curiosity, what's your big like game collection looking like? Like how many titles or how much space is it taking in your life? Um, it's some some shelves uh, of books. It's not that much actually. Um, friends of mine have way way more. It's like one friend of mine has this whole wall full of World of Darkness books, and I think they are like if you if you could actually sell them all, which it would probably be so much work that yeah, it doesn't really matter. Um, that would be like two cars or something like that. <laughs> Um, so I don't actually have that much. I switched to um, pretty much exclusively uh, electronic rule books and, and character sheets and whatnot years ago. So most is on my laptop and some backup disks. And uh, yeah, it's it's not that much actually. Yeah, and if there's any uh, other things you want to add, like any small RPGs that you think people should hear about or things they should consider, uh, that now would be the perfect time. Um, Grant Howard does great games um, in general, especially rules light games like Goblin Quest, where you play goblins and there's actually a die roll result where your goblin dies because, well, dying goblins is fun. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> he actually uh, co-wrote the newest version of Paranoia, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a um, really dystopian um uh, society run by a computer in an underground bunker and the computer is actually in your head and the computer sees everything you do and uh, well the punishment for most crimes is death and uh, not being happy is a crime so are you a happy citizen you have to play paranoia at least once in your life it's 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 so horrifically brilliant um unchained is uh, un unbound sorry it's another game and and yeah uh, spire and what so check out grant howard he's great pretty much everything he does is great um every time he starts a kickstarter i just yell uh, shut up and take my money um then I would actually encourage you to check out uh, Rizos uh, or Rises or whatever, R-I-S-U-S, uh, core uh, gaming document, I wouldn't call it a book, is like four uh, uh, pages, four A4 or letter pages. Um, and I think you actually only need half of that to play. And it's a functional system. It does everything you want it to do. Um, on a on a uh, basic level and if you don't know what to do on a lazy Sunday afternoon just find some people and play that um, <clears throat> then I forgot what it is called but there are actually card game decks for um, role playing games where whenever you feel like it or whenever you want to do something you just draw a card out of the deck and the card gives you a few pointers. Um, there's like some words on it and um, a score from really bad to really good, um, where you succeed and what elements you might want to bring into into the game. If you feel like pre playing really rules light, then that's perfect. Great worlds to check out, even though I don't like the system that much. Is uh, Deadlands uh, Seventh 
C, uh, Deadlands is a um, um, Wild West type setting with uh, magic and zombies and uh, tribal warriors and uh, steampunk elements and all that you like. 7C is a swashbuckling adventure type game where you can, if you are a hero, you can actually fight like 20, 30 people without problems and then you have to face the captain of the ship and then it gets really interesting. Um, World of Darkness used to be a pretty okay system. It, it has uh, the, I think the most well-known system is Vampire, where you actually play a vampire with all the, all the vampire stuff that you ever wanted in your life. And then you can play werewolves and changelings and and everything else and mages in this. It's our world, but it's not very much not. Check out that at some point or another. There's the old stuff and the new stuff. I haven't played much of the new stuff, but yeah, check that out. And I think I could go on for a while, but... That yeah, we've only be. touched the iceberg on this podcast, and it's not the last time I'm going to talk about different RPGs. I'm going to try to isolate, hopefully, you know, maybe a guest or two on future episodes for out there, isolating like Vampire the Masquerade or, you know, Shadowrun or just getting really into the weeds, as they say, about each of these RPGs. But for a, a kind of introductory generic uh, primer, I, I think this has been a fantastic episode, Dan. If people want to find you or hear your l- lovely German tones, where should they go? Um, yeah, I'll just go on Twitter probably at uh, Evil Dan Wallace. And I used to do a uh, RPG talk show on uh, the All for Geek Alliance with uh, trainer Jody, uh, or uh, just Jody, <laughs> who you had on the first episode, I think. That is correct. We had Jody on episode one. Yeah, so if you want to look back at the plot hook in, then you can find me there. And yeah. I post a lot of food on my on my Twitter. Be warned. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. Uh, if you want to find me on Twitter, it's at classy underscore Don. The RPG my RPG podcast uh, is on Podbean. It's my RPG podcast dot Podbean dot com, and the email is the same my RPG podcast at gmail dot com for any questions or inquiries. Thank you very much, and I will see you at the table. Mm-hmm.